Now we're going to discuss Chapter 2 in the PMBOK Guide, which talks about the environment in which projects operate and how that environment affects the way that we manage our projects. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. We've got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. So we're first going to talk about influences inside of the organization that change how we manage our project or affect it. Let me first share something with you. So there's this idea of bubbles, bubbles being able to protect you from the outside world, like this movie Bubble Boy, if you've ever seen that. The bubble protects him from germs in the outside world. Now the truth is, is that in project management, our projects don't operate in the bubble. We're influenced by things inside and outside of our organization that change how we manage the project. So influences inside the organization could include things like organizational structure, culture, policies and procedures, and so on. Let's first talk about organizational structure, the different types and how those affect the way that we manage projects. So in organizations, we really have two, this is two ends of a spectrum, two different types of organizational structures. On one end, you have functional organizations where functional managers have more power and authority. Those functional managers could be people like the head of accounting, head of marketing, the vice president of construction, something like that. They're functional managers. And in those organizations, they have more power and authority. Now on the other end, you have project-oriented organizations where project managers have more power and authority. And obviously, if you're in a functional organization, getting the resources you need and the budget that's required to get the work done is probably going to be a little bit more challenging. Now these are two ends of a spectrum. In the middle, you have matrix organizations, which are a combination of those two things. And most organizations are really have matrix designs. Now here's an overview of all the different types of organizational structures. Don't stress too much initially. We'll walk through this. On the left-hand side, you're going to see different organizational structures. And on the top, you're going to see how they affect those structures, how they affect the authority of the project manager, whether their role is part-time or full-time, and whether the project manager has resources available to them and control the budget, and whether or not they have project management administration staff. So this is staff that would help them as they maintain their schedules, their costs, as they monitor risks, and so on. They're just supporting the project manager. So let's look at first the structures in blue that we've already started discussing. Let's start first with the functional organization. So in those situations, the project manager's authority, as we just go across the row here, is going to be little to none. The functional managers have much more authority. And the project manager's role may be part-time. They may not be full-time on their projects. There may be little or no resources dedicated to those projects, and the functional manager controls the budget. And any administration staff for the project manager would be part-time, typically. So you can start to see that in these types of situations or organizations, it's difficult, going to be very difficult, for the project manager to, to be successful. It requires a lot more coordination and effort. Now, going down to the bottom of this, uh, the blue items, let's look at the project-oriented structure. The project manager is going to have much more authority. Their role is oftentimes going to be full-time, and they're going to have control of budget and resources, and perhaps even a full-time administration staff, project management administration staff. And then there's matrix organizations in the middle. You've got three different types, a strong, a weak, and a balanced. A balance is right in the middle. A strong matrix is where the project manager has a little bit more authority than the functional manager. And the way that I remember this is that since this book was written by the Project Management Institute, they think a strong matrix is where a project manager has more authority, at least a little bit more. And the project manager's role is often full-time, and they have some control or more control of the resources in the budget and perhaps a full-time staff. Now, the weak matrices, the weak matrix organization is where the project manager has less authority. It's viewed as weak. Although they may have some, it's still low. And their role may be part-time, and again, their control of resources in the budget is going to be low and really in the hands of the functional manager. So it's kind of like there's a lot of organizations that are matrix structures, 
but it's where in that spectrum are we? A strong matrix is where the project manager has more authority. A weak matrix is where they have less. So here's some examples of that. In the functional organization, the staff is often grouped by specialty or functional area, like marketing, finance, HR, and so on. And each department oftentimes completes a project or projects independently. So perhaps on a project or various projects, the staff in blue are working on it. And a lot of times it's really the, if it's a coordinated project, the coordination is done by the functional manager. There's not really a project manager necessarily overseeing the work. There's a lot of coordination done by functional managers or even a project manager. It's just really a coordinating role, not a role where they have management of the resources. They're just coordinating things. Now, a project-oriented organization is where project staff report directly to a project manager. So those project managers are going to do their performance reviews and so on. They're going to have control of the resources underneath them. And the teams are often co-located. Oftentimes those teams will sit in the same room or the same office building, and they'll have, in some cases, some virtual interaction. So you can see how those two types of organizations, how they're structured differently and uh, how their hierarchies look. Now let's look at some of the other ones just quickly. There's other structures in organic, multi-divisional, virtual, hybrid, and PMO. They're really a, a, a mix of things. The one that we're going to talk about in just a minute here is a PMO, the Project Management Office. And in those situations, the uh, PM's authority is high, the PM's roles are full-time, and the resources and the budget is controlled by the project manager. So it's very similar to a project-oriented organization, but we'll come back to PMOs in just a moment. We've already talked about this, but here are the different types of matrix organizations. You have the weak, the strong, and the balanced. Again, the weak matrix is where the functional managers have more power, and the strong matrix is where project managers have more power and influence. And remember, the way to, that I remember this at least is that this textbook is written by the Project Management Institute, and they think project managers have, or a strong matrix is where PMs have more power and influence. Now, getting back to the original question, because we're talking about how things inside and outside the organization affect the way we manage our projects, we might ask ourselves, why does the structure matter? Probably the most important reason, at least from my opinion, is it helps you know how to fight for the people you need and the resources you need. It becomes easy to do that in a project-oriented environment or structure, but if you have a functional organization, it can be more difficult to secure resources with functional managers, and you're almost borrowing their people. You're borrowing their time. And so it may be that a functional manager comes to you and has a different priority than your own project, and so maybe they pull your resources off. And so it gets difficult, much more difficult, for, to fight for the people and the resources you need. Okay, let's look at a quick case study here. And we're going to use um, WeChat, the app that's often used in, uh, in China for networking and messaging and other things. But first, let me remind you that we often work cross-functionally on projects and share resources. So a project in and of itself may impact several different functional areas. And there's a lot of coordination that's required because of that. We're still talking about organizational influences that affect our project. Let's talk now about organizational process assets, what those are. So organizational process assets are plans, processes, policies, procedures, and knowledge bases specific to the organization. There's really two categories of them, processes and procedures and corporate knowledge bases. And certainly processes that the organization has could impact what we do on our project. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. So some of the processes and procedures could include things like company policies, templates, change control procedures, financial procedures, organizational communication requirements, and so on. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of examples of these at your own job or in previous jobs. An example of this might be a schedule template. That's something that the organization maybe has asked all project teams to use. They say, start with this schedule template. That's something that we want everybody to use across all the projects in the organization. Another example of a process or procedure that could affect the way we manage our project is a you know company policies about work, you know, work for working from home procedures. Maybe everybody on Wednesdays are supposed to work from home. That certainly could affect how we manage our project. 
We can't have customers coming into our office on Wednesdays because nobody's going to be there. And so that policy could affect how we manage our project. Here's another example of a process or a procedure that could affect the way we manage our project. So maybe there's some policy or procedure that says that all projects over $100,000 in, in an estimated cost must be reviewed and approved by the CEO. Okay, we've got to make sure we follow that, and that's considered as we plan our project. We have to get that approval. Now, the second aspect of organizational process assets, in addition to processes and procedures, are corporate knowledge bases. Some examples could include, include systems containing all versions of our documents, financial databases, issues and defect management systems, and project files from our previous projects. So let me give you an example of that. Google Drive is a simple example of a, could be a corporate knowledge base. Uh, several companies are using Google services to share and store files. Maybe that's where we store all of our project documentation. That's a knowledge base. Another example that's used actually a lot, even more than Google Drive, is Microsoft SharePoint. It's a place where we as a team can go, or as an organization, can go and share documentation. Perhaps we say, okay, across the organization, we want all project teams to upload their documentation to SharePoint. And so if someone in the future does a similar project, they can refer to our documentation from the past. Another thing that impacts our projects are enterprise environmental factors. A little different than organizational process assets. So these are conditions not under the control of the project team that influence the project and how we manage it. And it could include things like we've already discussed, organizational culture, structure and govern governance, the geographic distribution of facilities and resources, government standards, existing human resources, the condition of the market that could affect our project. If um, demand completely drops for a product that we're developing, maybe a project gets canceled because of that. And also political climate, that could affect our projects and how we manage them. So what's important to note here is that these are really conditions as it says. With organizational process assets, those are do oftentimes documentation or databases. These are conditions, situations, not under the control of the project team. So an example are, could include existing human resources. So maybe as a project manager, we don't have an opportunity to select our project team and hire new resources. Maybe we're just given resources. That certainly could affect how we manage our project. Maybe we don't have any input as to who is on our team. Another example could be marketplace conditions. If we're developing a new oil refinery, if a price of a barrel of oil drops, maybe our project is going to be halted. That's a condition not under the control of the project team that could affect it, affect the project. Then there's political climate. Here's an example. If a new politician wins an election, government-funded projects could be at risk. Maybe they have a platform that doesn't, you know, is inconsistent with the previous politician and they decide to cancel our government funded project because it's you know not viewed as important anymore or a priority another example of an enterprise environmental factor could be culture like we've already talked about maybe there's a culture at the organization that everybody leaves at 4 p.m that certainly could change how we schedule our project we only want to schedule days or uh, work until 4 p.m on a given day or maybe all employees are expected to work late. That certainly could change our schedule as well. That's going to change how we manage our project. Okay, now we're shifting gears here a little bit and talk, going to talk about PMOs. Again, this is something else that could influence the way we manage our projects. So a PMO is a project management office. And what they do is they standardize project governance across an organization and group. They want projects to be managed in a consistent way, in a standard way, across the organization. So they facilitate the sharing of resources and tools, provide coaching and training to PMs and project teams, and may monitor compliance to standards. So certainly if a PMO has given guidance or governance as to how we should manage our project, that's what we need to follow. That's going to influence what we do. And there's three different types of PMOs. There's supportive PMOs that provide consulting by supplying templates, best practices, and training 
So they're really helping us, holding our hand. There's also controlling, which provides support, but also require compliance. There's a compliance requirement there. So it's all it's about help, but also there's a compliance attached to it. Uh, some people view them as police officers, even though it's probably not a good representation, but there's compliance required. Then there's directive PMOs. They take control of projects by directly managing them. Okay, now let's talk about project stakeholders, because the stakeholders could certainly influence how we manage our project as well. Stakeholders are anyone who may be affected by the project. They may or may not be actively involved. They may be positively or negatively affected, and they may have competing expectations. We need to monitor these relationships because if a stakeholder has a lot of power, it's potential that they could shut down our project or change you know, quite a bit about it. And here's a kind of an illustration of some stakeholders on projects. The first thing you should know that the project team itself, those are stakeholders, stakeholders of the project. That's going to include the project manager and the project management team, people who are helping the project manager, assisting with his work, his or her work. Other project team members, these are the people oftentimes getting the work done for constructing a building. It could be the roofers, the plumbers, the electricians, and so on. Uh, and other sponsors. These are on the project team, but they're also part of the overall list of stakeholders. Other stakeholders, though, could include a portfolio and a program manager or a program management office, operations teams and operations management, functional managers, sellers, and business partners. All of these individuals could be stakeholders on our project. Now, here's different types of stakeholders. Some we've already mentioned. A sponsor is the person providing the resources, responsible for enabling success. Customers are going to be the ones that are going to be approving and managing the project's product service or result. Users are those who are actually using the output or results of the project. Sellers are people that are entering into a contract to provide something for a project. So maybe on a construction project, it could be we pay an outside company to handle the concrete, the laying of the concrete. They're sellers. And other organizational groups, internal groups affected by the activities of the project. Now let's talk about the project team. Remember, this is these are part of our these are considered stakeholders. We have project man the project manager and project management staff going to perform scheduling, budgeting, and reporting. The actual project team members, the project staff who are creating the deliverables. There could be support experts, people performing various roles such as giving us advice on logistics and safety and other things. There's customer representatives. They're actually the ones that are, um, you know, kind of our interface to to our um, our customer. If they're not on the project every day, we may have customer representatives who are representing the customer and working with the team and answering questions and resolving issues. Then there's sellers that we've already talked about, external companies that provide something for the project. Now, a team can be either dedicated or part-time. A project team can be dedicated, meaning that they're full-time on the project. This is what they the one thing that they work on, and they oftentimes report directly to the project manager. In some cases, though, our project team may be part-time. The actual project that we're managing may just be additional work for them. They could have multiple projects that are, they're working on, and they may have to be managing the time, their time appropriately. And oftentimes, in these cases, functional managers have control of resources. So project teams can be dedicated or part-time. So this was just an overview of different influences that could affect how we manage our project. As one final note, we wanted to mention if you're interested in looking at additional certifications in addition to project management, one that pairs really well with a PMP or a CAPM is a Lean Six Sigma certification. And you can get a free Lean Six Sigma certification over at our sister organization, SixSigmaSociety.org.